So the last presenter of the morning is me. So as I said before, my, my name is Mike Sider. I work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I have the pleasure of working on Lake Superior with Lake Char. Um, before I get into the presentation, I guess I'd like to recognize my co-authors. This is a collaborative effort to synthesize information about the fully recovered stocks in Lake Superior. Um, to borrow a line from my good friend Dan Ewell, I'm merely the good-looking front man for this effort today. Um, but a lot of not only their time, but the time and resources and staff time of these agencies go into the data sets that I'll be sharing. It's pretty simplistic summaries I'll be presenting, but the amount of data, the thousands of hours on, on Lake Superior to collect these long-term data sets just cannot be undersold. And so they, these agencies need to be recognized. The collapse of the lean form has been well described. I'm, not, I'm really not going to get into the, the factors that led to that in this presentation. Um, similar to Chris's presentation uh, describing really first the suppression of the exotic sea lamprey was important in this story. Um, until, those, until their numbers were under control, these, these populations just could not recover. Decades of stocking efforts certainly was a shot in the arm for many of these wild stocks. Um, we were fortunate in Lake Superior that there were still remnant stocks um, that recovered, unlike some of the other Great Lakes where they were completely wiped out. Um, as the stocks recovered, it was important that we limit fishing uh, mortality. Uh, lake trout are, are captured alongside Lake Whitefish, which are very lucrative fisheries in Lake Superior. And so trying to balance uh, the opportunities to fish for whitefish and yet rehabilitate lake, lean lake char was, was a challenge. By the late 80s, early 1990s, mo many of the stocks in the U.S. at least were showing signs of progress. Um, Mike Hansen's paper to describe rehabilitation at that time and uh, was like a, the, the seminal paper at that time. And, and what we, our thought was that was 25 plus years ago, a lot has changed in, in Lake Superior. And we've learned a lot about what fully recovered populations would look like in, in the Great Lakes, or at least in Lake Superior. And maybe some of the lessons learned here might provide some useful uh, insight for the other lakes where there are signs and if not trajectory towards um, rehabilitated uh, wild stocks. The data sets, like I said, are, you'll see it's pretty s simple summaries, but it's the data come from uh, the spring gillnet survey, which is a single mesh survey that's been conducted in many of these areas for decades and decades, provides interesting patterns in relative abundance and other, em other demographics. We have a small mesh survey that's conducted in most of the U.S. waters. Uh, small mesh, a um, couple different mesh sizes. Really the intent there is to track recruitment um, of young lake trout. And then more recently, we've combined the available information, both fishery data and fishery independent sources, to uh, put together statistical catch at age models, which provide us a lot of useful information and, and greater insight into the dynamics of these populations. Some of the, the following plots will be sort of organized by what we call the Lake Char Management Units. Um, not only do we often report statistics this way, this is often the, the spatial scale at which we try to manage these stocks. And so you'll see MN321 are the, the uh, Minnesota, then Wisconsin, and then sort of uh, moving, uh, as the numbers get larger, you're moving west to east in Michigan waters. I really don't have any data from Ontario waters um, only because they don't necessarily have similar standardized surveys and didn't quite fit with what I was trying to present today. But we work very closely with our colleagues in Ontario waters, and so a lot of the trends that I'll be reporting are not dissimilar to what they're seeing in Ontario waters. So the first thing we can look at that tells a lot of the story is the relative abundance from the spring survey. And and I've also, in a lot of the plots, added this vertical line. It's just 1993. It's sort of, that's the, the last year that uh, Mike's paper, uh, the Restore paper, that's as far as the data set went. So I wanted to provide some historical context, kind of where we were prior to 93, and then the trajectory since then. And it's interesting that in many units, Minnesota waters especially, there was a rapid increase in relative abundance during the 1990s into the early 2000s. 
And then in, in some areas, a bit of a, a leveling off. Um, Wisconsin water, similar trend. Um, and then some of the waters in Michigan, kind of east of the Keweenaw, they leveled off and, and, and leveled off a little bit earlier than some of the other parts of the lake. It's like they, the, the restoration was probably a bit earlier in those Michigan waters. A couple of areas where you saw a bit of a downtrend really were, were related to uh, fishery exploitation that might have been um, kind of exceeding what would be sustainable. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into uh, uh, mortality rates. If you pair the kind of the adult abundance with our recruit index, you also see an interesting pattern. Uh, during the 1990s, there was a rapid increase in the number of recruits and then a leveling off in some areas and, in, and really in parts of Michigan, even though it's arguably noisy data sets as, as relative abundance often can be from gillnets, you see a, a long term, uh, sorry, a more recent decline in recruitment in those Michigan waters, um, which may of course be indicative of some density dependent uh, effects on these populations. The current fisheries in Lake Superior, as I mentioned, there are, there are still commercial fisheries, although, and those are managed by state, tribal, and, and provincial governments. Um, they really are generally a bycatch in, in Lake Whitefish fisheries. There, there's some examples of, of fishermen targeting lake trout, but most of the time they'd like to avoid them if possible at, in their pursuit of Lake Whitefish. And so, uh, it, it, it can be uh, a struggle for managers to provide the opportunity for very healthy lake whitefish populations while still sustainably harvesting or allowing for uh, sustainable uh, management of the lake trout populations. And so as like most commercial fisheries, they're regulated by effort restrictions, gear restrictions, that sort of thing. I think what's been novel in the last 10, 15, 20 years has been the development of statistical catch at age models and the use of the output from these stock assessment models to set total allowable catch quotas. I think we've, we've gained a much better understanding of these stocks and, and better understanding of what sustainable mortality rates might look like. The sport harvest has really tracked along with uh, uh, the abundance of populations. The greater number of lake trout that we have in Lake Superior, the more and more interest there are, um, especially as we get these large uh, specimens and they're, they're targeted by anglers more and more and, and regulated similarly to other sport fisheries, length limits, bag limits, etc. But if, as I go to the next slide, we'll look at annual mortality rates. You'll kind of see that although there is, in most areas, operating commercial fisheries or sport fisheries, their contribution towards total mortality is, is relatively low. Um, places like Minnesota and parts of Michigan, the sport and commercial mortality rates combined are still less than sea lamprey mortality. And that's not really an indictment on the sea lamprey program, which is, is doing, in Lake Superior, by and large, a pretty good job of suppressing sea lamprey. It's more a reflection on, these are just lightly exploited populations by sport and commercial fisheries. The exception is WI2, which is the Apostle Islands region, which is about 40 miles, 50 miles east of here, which has had a long history of a very large whitefish commercial fishery. And you can see that in the commercial mortality rates. Uh, there was a, a period of time in the 80s where the mortality rates were very high, and you could see that. You could see the effects of ex in, in the size distribution. Uh, the Apostle Islands has several refuges, and you could see the age distributions were very different inside and outside the refuge. The effects of commercial fishing were very clear. That area went through a long period of time where, where exploitation was relatively similar to the other parts of the lake and saw great efforts in restoration. Those successes almost worked against us in some ways and maybe made us all a bit complacent about how much exploitation could, could take place. And you can see the, the, the mortality t rates rose very rapidly in, in the late 2000s. And we saw, that it, uh, we saw the effects of that really rapidly in terms of greater growth rates and effects on recruitment. So it's been sort of an unfortunate um, testing of what the upper limit of our more, uh, sustainable mortality rates are for Lake Char. For the next couple of graphics, it's, it's age information. And so I've sort of lumped it just in the, in the purpose of having a little greater uh, sample size. I've lumped more by ecoregion. So you see Minnesota North Shore, Western Arm of Lake Superior, east and west of the Kiwa and all that sort of thing. And this is the, I remind you, this is age information from that spring survey, which is a single mesh survey, has a pretty truncated length distribution of what it captures. 
even in the face of that, you can see in most of these areas, there, was, there has been a, a, a greater and greater proportion of older fish showing up in that survey, which is actually kind of remarkable. Um, but certainly if we were to show you uh, spawning surveys, you'd see the same thing, where there's greater and greater numbers. And it was probably not expected, given low mortality rates, these populations, these fish are uh, growing to greater and greater ages. And certainly we know from other systems they can uh, reach very old ages, and we're, we're seeing the effects of that. Or th their, the populations are allowed to kind of reach their, their potential now. It's pretty hard to fit Von B curves to a single mesh survey. You get wonky things with linear growth and that sort of thing. So we typically, to try to track growth, instead look at the modal age from that survey and say, what, what does mean length look like over time of that modal age? And that's, in this case, age 7. Um, what you see is in kind of western part of the Lake Superior Basin, um, a long-term decline in growth, but not, not, not a falling off off of the map or anything like that, just a gradual decline over time. Um, I mentioned the, the uh, rapid effects of high exploitation in the Apostle Islands area. You see the last couple of years where I have age information, that mean length at age all of a sudden jumps up very rapidly because we had, it, it's really it's a density dependent effect. We, we ratcheted down the population size and there was an immediate response in growth rates. Michigan waters kind of just peg along at, at not, not a whole lot of difference um, over time, which is maybe uh, almost we are, we've all, almost been too late in tracking some of the dynamics in Michigan waters because a lot of the, the, the changes took place kind of well before this time series. Although there has been changes in the population demographics and certainly changes in Lake Superior as the surface waters uh, steadily increase, the temperatures in the surface waters steadily increase, we haven't seen dramatic changes in reproductive timing for the lean form. Um, we still have really only, they are a fall spawning uh, morphotype and not seen drastic changes in the timing nor in fecundity. Um, more recent stu reproductive studies have measured fecundity of the lean form and compared that to historical accounts and they're really not substantially, have not really substantially changed. Age and maturity has shifted. Although when you look a little closer it, where we've looked at this, it's often length and maturity has changed very little and, and what really that change in age and maturity is not necessarily some drastic change in their reproductive biology, more so just a change in size at age. Although there was anecdotal reports or suspicion of skip spawning in, in the lean form in Lake Superior, tagging studies that seem to suggest that they, they, they must be uh, skipping spawning events, more recent work by Sean Sitar and Rick Getz has put a, a finer point on just the extent of that skip spawning. And it's anywhere from, you know, about 10 to 50 percent among uh, the lean morphotype across different populations in Lake Superior. Um, probably, you know, an adaptation to a relatively limited forage base, which I'll sort of show you. What's interesting about this, I guess, the recent story has been this, uh, the fact that the lean form disproportionately consumes rainbow smelt. Rainbow smelt are an exotic species in Lake Superior, but they, they really target them and, and utilize that prey source when it is available at times of the year and cause really high mortality rates on smelt, which is a good thing. Um, Without question, suppressing smelt numbers has had a positive effect on other native species in Lake Superior. As smelt numbers have been crunched down, they're not gone, but their their numbers are a fraction of what they used to be. The because leans are opportunistic feeders, they now move. You know, they are now feeding more and more on the native forage as well. And we've seen as the recovery of wild lean lean lake char has has taken place long-term declines in forage fish. If I show you uh, the USGS bottom trawl survey, just relative biomass of some of the key prey species, you can see, I do have to say it's not in altogether due to predation because some of these species, there are issues with sporadic ear classes and, and, and uh, kind of poor recruitment over time, but certainly that predation effect on, on the forage base is very real. Yet, the changes in growth were not drastic. Um, again, they're opportunistic. They've shifted towards other prey sources. I didn't show condition. I wasn't sure if I'd have time to share condition factor, but that hasn't changed dramatically uh, in many of these stocks either. 
they're well suited for low forage and can take advantage of other prey sources when others are, are in low abundance. What's been interesting and certainly of interest to anglers, sport anglers on Lake Superior, is that long-term suppression of smelt and low forage rates has not been a good thing for a lot of this introduced stock salmonids. Things like Chinook salmon and brown trout aren't necessarily flexible enough to switch over to other forage bases and so the survival of those stock salmonids has, has really gone down over time to the point where many of those stocking programs have been ceased. So sort of conclusions, um, as, as we think about it, the, it, it's been interesting in U.S. waters, the progression of recovery has sort of been from west to east. I think a lot of that has to do with nearshore habitat in Michigan waters, stocking programs that, programs that had immediate effect, and then you sort of saw Wisconsin come online, and Minnesota's been just slightly lagging behind, but now they're definitely seeing all the, the signs of fully recovered populations. With maybe the exception of a, a few areas, we are seeing very low mortality rates, and that's allowed the age compositions to expand and, and see their full potential. And although I didn't show spawning stock biomass, without a doubt, as the populations increase, the greater numbers of older fish has expanded. We are probably at 50-year highs in spawning, spawning stock biomass. Habitat has never been the limitation um, in Lake Superior. We never had major habitat loss or loss of habitat in general. And so now it's just a matter of building up those very old populations. The result, sort of um, not surprising, I guess, although always a bit concerning when you see declining recruitment and declining growth, especially in light of the entire Great Lakes where catastrophic events, you know, major ecosystem disruptions were always a little jittery on Lake Superior. But we still believe that what we're seeing are density-dependent effects. These are probably positive traits of a fully rehabilitated population. And, and we're sort of predicted, uh, people like Chuck Bronte in some earlier papers have said, the signs of a fully re rehabilitated population are probably density dependent effects in, in growth and recruitment. And so this shouldn't be surprising and, and, and not necessarily an alarming characteristic. So with that, um, I think we have time. I'd love to answer any questions for you. Um, I really don't understand the model details what you used, but you estimated the different modality sources and partitioned the source of modality, but how, how did you do that? It, it seems pretty difficult to, you know, segregate or distinguish the modality sources from time series data. So the, the, the assessment models incorporate both much of the, the time series data that I've presented, but also commercial and sport um, harvest and demographics. Without getting into a lot of the details of the stock assessment models, sea lamprey mortality is estimated externally from these stock assessment models and, and sort of hard-coded. Um, natural mortality is estimated but not allowed to, to very, very much. So we're really just estimating the two components of, of sport and commercial mortality in these stock assessment models. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mike. Uh, well, somebody has to be the, the hard question, Mike. Uh, the, the extraordinary mortality rates in Wisconsin don't seem compatible with what you said earlier about the, the, the stock assessment models are used to generate a total allowable catch. Presumably that total allowable catch uh, would be sustainable. If you implement the total allowable catch, how do you get these mortality rates that to my eye appear to be pushing 75%, or I'm sorry, 0.75Z. Instantaneous. That's yeah. very high. It is very high, Mike. So maybe you don't want to answer this. Well, it's okay to back the big off, but is no, there? No, I, I think there's lessons to be learned from that. So I, I, before I worked for the service, I worked with Wisconsin DNR. So I was involved with some of those, that time period. And what it was is with these stock assessment models, although they work very well, it was, uh, we didn't have the scaling of the population right, right? You can match trends really well, but we've thought there was a lot more lake, at one time, a lot more lake trout in the Apostle Islands region than what we've come to find out was the case. 
So if you operate under the assumption, you apply a 40% mortality, maximum mortality rate to almost double what we think was there now, that's how we got into this mess. I shouldn't say mess, but because they've, they've, they've certainly taken corrective measures and, and mortality rates have come down, but that's sort of the quick and dirty how we got to that point. Mike, it seems like uh, WI2 is kind of an unintentional experiment, as you mentioned. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised to see that it didn't reach out much further than WI2. I mean, look at your statistics. Yeah, there. so like I, I did not have uh, the adjacent management unit, which is MI2, the Western Michigan Waters. You certainly see there the relative abundance had come down pretty those those units mix, all right? We operate under these management units, but that's not necessarily biologically how these stocks work. And so there are some of the adjacent Michigan units certainly exchange a lot of fish. And if you look more closely at MI2, you definitely see the effects of that exploitation in the Apostle Islands. I think everybody's ready for lunch. I'd like to thank everyone this morning for their presentations.